there are lots of reminders. Um, I know it's getting stressful things in your lives, and um, so I just want to remind you that if you haven't done your original posting on the discussion on Canvas, make sure you get to that. Because tomorrow you're going to reply to two of your peers in the discussion if you haven't done it yet. Today we're going to go over reproduction and hopefully get through STDs and contraception. And then in lab, um, I made this checkoff sheet because someone asked for it. So um, I suggest sit down with the models. There's two models for the female and two models for the male. So make sure that you know both. And then um, if you want to get ahead, we're going to go over on Tuesday embryological development. We're going to, that matches more the lecture for Tuesday. Um, if you want to go over the models, you can. But um, if you want to hold off on that, that's fine too. And I'm happy to go through it with you in lab. I'll do a little review too. So Tuesday. Oh no, I guess that's even further out. Oh my goodness. Um, so that's even the following Tuesday after Thanksgiving, but um, I can review them if you want to start getting started with the reviews over the weekend and then the long week next week. So Tuesday, coming Tuesday, we'll finish, if we don't finish reproduction today, we will, and then we'll get into development. Lab 34. So. Lab 34 really could be done at home if you want, most of it. There's one portion that we will do. It's an activity to see how quickly a disease like an STD can spread. Um, definitely will be a reminder of how things like COVID can spread as well. But the rest of the lab you can do on your own if you want. It's up to you. So depending on your time and how you want to spend it. A really good website is the Planned Parenthood website. It's based in scientific evidence. So if you wanna work on lab 34, that's a great place to go for collecting your data, um, reading about all the different forms of contraception and STDs. Planned Parenthood has very up-to-date data, science-based information on STDs and contraception. When we come back from Thanksgiving break, uh, we'll finish up development. If we haven't, we'll get into the nervous system, embryological development lab, also time to study the torso models, the reproductive systems, and the embryo models and slides. I already have up on Canvas study materials for all of these for the lab practical that'll be on Thursday, December 2nd. Plus, I just gave you the checkoff sheet. This is what you need to know. So um, hopefully that'll make clear what you need to know. I listed also all the structures, both that are on male and female. One of the things that's really good to think about as you're studying is to, I know because everybody gets really nervous and anxious during exams, is um, just when you look at a model, the first thing you should do is look at the whole thing and say, that's a male or that's a female, because then it eliminates a lot of the structures that you need to know either on the male or the female, right? And so I find that because students get anxious and overwhelmed and also sometimes don't study enough, that structures that are on the male, they'll be naming structures that are on the female. And then after you go through it, and they'll say, well, that was a female structure that you put on the male. And I go, oh my gosh, how do they do that? Well, it's anxiety and studying and et cetera. So um, definitely good to start studying and contextualize the first thing, male or female, and then go from there. You have, so Thursday, December 2nd, December 2nd, yeah, is the lab practical on this. That's all we're doing that day. Um, learning log, a last learning log for the class is due on December 3rd. Another thing, if you want to knock that out early, it's open and ready to go. Tuesday, December 7th, we'll do an animal behavior lecture. It's a really fun lecture to end the class on. 
and you do have a Canvas lab about animal behavior and ethograms, and what an ethogram is is just studying the behavior of an animal. So again, you can do this ahead of time on your own. You just need to study an animal. So if you have a pet, you can do a study, like for example, um, I have two cats and a dog. I could put out various like kinds of food and see how they respond. You could do it on one animal. You could do it on a few animals. It's up to you. If you don't have an animal at home, you can go outside and observe squirrels, observe uh, Canada geese. So that's easy enough. Or you could go to a pet store and observe, or if you want to go to the zoo, for example. So I just want to, I like to kind of um, remind you about this because you do need to do some observations of an animal. And for some of you, it's not as accessible as others. So um, you can plan out your time for that. That's due by the 9th. But you can, again, get it done early if you want. Thursday, December 9th is the last unit exam. Just this unit, unit five. That's it. Extra credit I have up. Again, another thing you can knock out early if you want. If by this time you take the exam and you realize that you are at 88%, 78%, you should prepare to take the cumulative optional exam. That'll be the following Thursday, but hopefully none of you will need to. If I took the final exam and had a bad grade, will that It will. However, let's say you're at 88%. Even if you got zero on the final exam, it will not lower your grade to a C. So it's not enough to lower you to the next letter grade down, but it is enough to get you to the next letter grade up. So that's why I make it optional. And then again, by the time you take this, we'll see if you need to take it, and I will kind of say to you, you're so close, you better come take this. But hopefully you all will not need to, is my, my hope for you. Anybody, any questions about anything up here? Okay, just like to try and get you comfortable. I know you got a lot coming at you very quickly these days. Okay, let's continue where we left off. We're gonna talk about the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system. So we're gonna start with males and looking at sperm. What you looked at in lab was inside of the testes, there's a lot of structures in which sperm are made. And so what I think was maybe a little confusing was that there were squiggly little sperm inside, but you didn't really see a close up of them. So when we're talking about what you looked at in lab is in here, those little squiggles in the middle. What those little squiggles, if we blew them up, further, they look like this, so that a sperm doesn't carry much, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, the sperm has a head that has the nucleus, the 23 chromosomes that it's going to carry to the egg. It has enzymes called acrosomes in the head. There's in here what's called a midpiece, and it has a whole bunch of mitochondria. Mitochondria are really important organelles for processing energy. Specifically, in semen, there's um, sugars so that it can activate these mitochondria to take those sugars and turn them into a more useful form of energy, ATP, to keep them wiggling their tails or the flagella to swim toward the egg. Sperm are produced in the testes, the male gonads. The testes also, if you remember, produce testosterone. All the other structures are accessories to getting the sperm to the egg. So there are structures that are going to help the sperm mature from a single cell to having a tail and being able to swim to creating semen for helping the sperm to uh, have sugars to swim, helping the penis to become erect, 
so that if we think about the structure of a female, the vagina is like this, a tube that goes up, and typically penises are kind of down like this, so they don't really match, but what's in the semen is going to be some chemicals that are gonna help the penis to become erect, filled with blood so that it can insert into the vagina. So it's a very precise kinds of chemicals within the semen that are going to help facilitate that. Also, it's going to help the um, penis to slide into the vagina, make it slippery as well. So lots of things that are accessories to this whole thing to activate the semen, uh, sorry, activate the sperm, conduct them into the vagina to get as close to the egg as possible, nourish those sperms so that they can swim as long as possible to get there, and even temporarily just store and help the sperm mature. This is the male reproductive system. Um, my son, who's 10, we just went through this the other day because he had some questions. And so pulled this out and he's like, did you make that? And I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm not that good of an artist. But, um, and he said, whoa, that's complex. I said, yes, it is complex. And he said, well, why? And because there's a lot of things that have to happen in order for reproduction to occur. So remember when we talked about the differences between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction, all of this needs to be present. And so when we talk about the complexity of the differences between asexual being very simple and sexual reproduction, it's not just that you have to have sperm and egg, but you need all of these structures to make sperm. And we'll talk about all the complexity of the female reproduction to make the egg, and then also to get them together. And so, um, like he said, he's like, wow, that's complex. And I was like, yeah, that is a great observation. So in the male reproduction system, I always think it's very fascinating that the penis where sperm come out of, right next to the testes where the sperm are produced, they're right next to each other. But look at the journey that the sperm have to take. They have to go from the testes into the epididymis and the epididymis they're going to mature and what we mean by that is they go from cells that are round to cells that have a flagella and a tail and a midpiece with the mitochondria and get the acrosome so all of that's going to happen in the epididymis and then once they are mature enough they will travel up the vas deferens and so again this is i think fascinating because right next to each other but the vas deferens then takes the sperm on a journey to become part of semen which is critical in getting them to be nourished and to help them get all the way to the egg. And so there's a journey of the vas deferens goes all the way up and way far away from the penis then, right? And around and over the urinary bladder past the pubic bone, which is also called the pubic symphysis, comes around and then the vas deferens is going to go past three different glands that are going to help make the semen. And so we have the seminal vesicle here, which merges, and that's what, you know, another interesting feature of the male reproduction system that's very different than the female is that the reproductive system and the urinary system merge right here in the prostate gland. And in the female reproductive system, we don't merge the urinary system and the reproductive system. There's two different tubes for that. So in here, inside the prostate gland is where the urethra merges with the vas deferens. And then this little tiny gland right here called the bulbal urethral gland, it's gonna add more. So three things that are going to make semen. And then the urethra is where the semen comes out of as well as urine comes out of. The other thing that is key in all of this is that if you look at the structure of the penis, it looks like spongy. And so we have two structures in there that are gonna help the penis go from being smaller and limp to getting larger and erect so that it fits into the vagina properly. And you have, see these boxes here? These boxes, these are called the, corpus cavernosum, like caverns, 
So that may be a like clue to remember the difference between corpus cavernosum and corpus spongiosum. The caverns are here to fill with blood. And that's going to allow the penis to get larger and get erect. And you also have the corpus, this other skinnier parts here that again look spongy, corpus spongiosum. So let's again review sperm production. The testes are filled with seminiferous tubules. That's the tubes that you were looking at in lab and what I was referring to here when you looked under the microscope the other day. And you saw a lot of those. A lot of those are inside of the testes when you looked at the microscope slide. Inside you saw a variety of kinds of cells. There were these triangles that led to an empty space, which is the tube of the tubules. And inside of those triangles, you have Sertoli cells and you have spermatogonia. And the spermatogonia cells are important for undergoing, uh, for making the cells undergo spermatogenesis or the meiosis version of making sperm. So this is what you looked under the microscope. And so what you were seeing was, again, a variety of these triangular shapes with the spermatogonia cells inside of them. And then you have cells that are going to help, these cells are going to help to make the sperm. And then those wiggles in the middle were the sperm themselves. Um, with the, go back to the testes, inside of the testes, so what we are looking at in terms of the seminiferous tubules, you have a lot of these tubes that are coiled up inside of the testes. And so you were looking at a cross section. Basically, if you took one of those tubes like that, stretched it out, cut it, and then you were looking down into it, you'd see the tube part here of the seminiferous tubules. So you see a lot of those. And the reason why they're long and skinny and coil, then they can coil up, is to give a lot of surface area for a lot of production of sperm. Hugging the outside of the testes is the epididymis. And again, you can see a lot of coiling of tubes that are going to help the sperm then um, get things like their acrosomes, the enzymes on their heads, their midpiece to have filled with mitochondria and also their tails, the flagella. Very different process of meiosis between the, well, not very different in one way, but very similar in another way. So here's a process of meiosis or spermatogenesis to make sperm. That you start out with a spermatogonia. You start out with a cell that the important thing about this is that we want the chromosome number to come down to 23. So that 23 from sperm meet up from 23 from egg and bring us back to our chromosome number because again, one of the things about chromosomes in a species is that if you have too much DNA or too little DNA, it's not a good thing. So we want the precise amount of DNA. So meiosis, the whole point is to half the amount of DNA in the sperm and the egg so they can come back together and make 46 chromosomes in the embryo fetus baby. Spermatogonia undergo um, meiosis this cell matures into the primary spermatocyte. It undergoes meiosis one. In the first stage of meiosis, this cell is going to go from diploid, having 46 chromosomes. Chromosomes replicate into 46 times two. So that here we have 46 chromosomes, or I should say 23 times two, 23 with two pairs each. So 23 times two chromosomes, the secondary spermatocytes they undergo meiosis two, and those 23 times two, right, 23 times two become a 23 and a 23. And again, 23 times two become a 23 and a 23. So what you end up with in the testes are four spermi spermat uh, spermatids, sorry. Your four spermatids end up going into the epididymis where they mature to get all the rest of the pieces that I've been talking about. So that every sperm has 23 chromosomes. We're going to look at the female and see a bit of a difference in what happens during meiosis, and I'll talk about why. Okay. 
can you remind us what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis? Mitosis and meiosis? Mitosis is going to make a, as close to genetically identical copy of a cell as possible. All of our cells, mitosis is for growth, development, repair, and maintenance of all of the cells in our body with the exception of sperm and egg. So mitosis, once, when we talk about development next week, once you have the sperm and egg come together and they make that first cell, that cell then undergoes mitosis. It becomes two cells, four cells, eight cells, and continue until it makes all the cells that we need in our body. So mitosis is for growth and development in those early stages. For us right now, we are very little growing. We are pretty much maintaining and repairing and so then all the cells in our body are being replaced over time by this process of mitosis. Um, there's a few cells in your body that do grow throughout your lifetime, like cartilage-based cells like your nose. You will notice like over time, like once you're you know, your age, and then you see over time that because the rest of your body is really not growing anymore, you, your face looks different, right? And so one of the things that makes your face look different is your nose actually grows over time. Your ears also are another thing because they're cartilage based, they grow over time. Um, but the rest of our body doesn't grow. And so it just needs to be repaired, any cells that get old and they need to be repaired and maintained. So that's mitosis. Meiosis only, the only thing that meiosis does is to make sperm and biological males and make egg and biological females. That's the only thing it's for. Good question, good little review of that. So again, the sperm looks like this if we blew it up under a microscope. And then what you see is in the head area is a nucleus, acrosomes, which we're gonna talk about, what they're for, enzymes. Midpiece has mitochondria and the tail is called the flagella. So it has these four important parts to it, but not much else to it. Does this, if you kind of think about, if you took one of them and you're thinking about all of the organelles in a cell, does the sperm have the ability to contribute all of the organelles to make a full cell? No, it's missing a lot of organelles. So the sperm is very slim and sleek because its job in reproduction is to just get the nucleus with the 23 chromosomes to the egg and then the egg the oocyte is going to take over because it's going to have all the organelles for the cell. But the sperm's job is to swim there, get there. So the conduction of sperm, let's talk about, again, kind of I went through this a little bit, is that sperm are made in the testes and then they mature in the epididymis. Do you want to call it the epididymis? However you want to talk about it. So they not only store sperm, but again, the, store, the sperm mature, they get the rest of the things besides the nucleus attached on there. So they are temporarily stored and matured there. This leads out of the scrotum. So remember the epididymis is hugging the outside of the scrotum. And then it leads to the vas deferens, that tube that goes up and around and over. Vas deferens is a long tube that is going to pass a few other glands that are going to help semen to be made. In the prostate, the vas deferens joins the urethra. We have the merging of the urinary system and the reproductive system in the male in the prostate. So again, just a long journey from the testes, the epididymis, the vas deferens up and over. We're gonna talk next about the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, the bubble urethral gland, and then out the urethra. So semen, as I mentioned, its contribution comes from three different glands. It's not just about sperm fertilizing egg, but it's about the components of the semen need to be there as well to conduct and nourish and help the sperm 
get over to the egg. And it's a really, really long journey for the sperm. So one, seminal vesicle. In the semen, the seminal vesicle is going to contribute sugar, help those mitochondria to spin that flagella. It also has prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are going to help the penis to contract and go from, remember the vagina is like this, and so the penis doesn't really match like that, but when it gets erect, it slides like pieces of a puzzle into the vagina. The prostate gland is gonna do a few things. It's gonna also have things that are gonna help the motility of the sperm, help them to swim. The vagina, because it's a portal to the outside world of the female, it's going to have things like lysosomes and it's also gonna be acidic. So that's a challenge for the sperm to live and get past the vagina so that they can get to the egg. And so the prostate gland is gonna to help to neutralize the acidity of the vagina and help the sperm to not just kind of fall apart from high acidity. And then you have the bulbal urethral gland. It's also called the copper's gland. It produces mucus for lubrication. So it's gonna help the skin of the penis to get kind of slippery so it can slip up into the vagina. So we have like natural lubricant within the semen as well. So all these things are very important to getting the sperm as close to the egg as possible. So let's talk about part two, the eggs. Get a lot more complexity. There is, I was reading an article yesterday about the, while we looked at the complexity of the male, the female, even though we're gonna look at the structures that seem like a little more straightforward, the complexity of the system is far, far more complex. So the eggs are produced in the ovaries, which are the gonads of the female. All of your eggs in a female are produced before she's born. So in the process of development internally as a fetus, those eggs are in the ovary already. What you saw in lab was the adding of the follicle cells and the follicular liquid in those layers. Those get added in the maturity of the female but the eggs are already there. All of the other structures are accessories to help get the egg and the sperm to meet. And then also if there is a um, merging of the egg and sperm to help mature, nourish, protect that growing embryo fetus baby. Sorry. So everything else is just accessories to this system. This is a really awesome picture because it shows ovulation. You might think that there's like a nice little tube like what you saw with the vas deferens that the semen would travel out of, but really weird is that with the ovary, the oocyte or egg, it actually bursts through the wall of the ovary. There's a little bit of a space, and it's not like a huge space, but there are what we call fimbri of the fallopian tube that are right next to, they're not totally connected to the ovary, but they're here in the fimbri, they're like little fingers that are going to help suck that egg into the fallopian tube. But sometimes with ovulation, females can feel during ovulation like a weird twitching in their side during that time, or a little bit of pain, actually. And so some people can be like, oh yeah, I just ovulated, because they can feel it um, because of this bursting. So here's a female reproductive system, very different than the male, and a lot of different features in that the urinary system has its own tube out of the body, but the reproductive system has its own as well. So. You have the ovary, there's fimbri, it looks like again, like finger-like structures that are very close, as close to the ovary without actually being connected. And they're going to help during ovulation to help the oocyte move through the fallopian tube. 
a fallopian tube. So you can see here, it's labeled as the uterine tube. It's called the uterine tube, the fallopian tube, or the oviduct. It goes by a bunch of different names. So I like, for example, on the practical, I'll accept any one of the three. If I have a question about it on the exam, I usually would list them all, just so you know what I'm talking about. Fimbria are not only outside of the fallopian tube, but they're also inside. So they're inside helping because it's got to go up and over and down. So they're like boop, 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 helping that oocyte move. So let me just um, tell you that before the egg is fertilized, it's not called an egg. It's called an oocyte, O-O-C-Y-T-E. This is a kind of a miscommunication in biology that there is a difference between these are not really eggs, they're oocytes, called an egg once fertilization happens. So it's very temporarily an egg because once it goes from an egg, fertilization, and then it starts undergoing the process of what we call cleavage or mitosis, cleaves in a two, cleaves in a four, and it starts to become different names. So they're really not eggs per se, they're oocytes. Um, the oocyte then travels down the fallopian tube, oviduct, ovarian tube, uterine tube, can go by a lot of things, and then it's going to come into the uterus. The uterus isn't like a big hollow organ. The uterus has a very small hollow area. It's mostly muscle. So when women have their menstrual cycle, you've probably heard that women can have cramps. The reason why they have cramps is because of all this muscle contracts. And what the muscle is going to do is it's going to push out the endometrium, the lining of this inside hollow part of the uterus. The point of menstruation is that you do not have, once a month, a fertilized oocyte. So you gotta get rid of the endometrium. The endometrium is there in the meantime of if you have a fertilized oocyte, an egg, to help the egg get nourishment so that it can have energy and be protected during cleavage when it goes from that first cell to two, to four, to eight, to eventually we'll go through the stages of development until a placenta is formed to make a blood to blood connection between the fetus and the mother so that the mother can bring nutrients and can bring oxygen and other good things to the growing fetus and take away waste products and anything else that needs to be taken away. So at first there is no connection there, but the, we need some support system. So the endometrium is this whole support system in the meantime of having that connection directly with the mother. If there is no connect, if there is no fertilization, the body after a few, few days, the oocyte starts to disintegrate. And as it is disintegrating, hormones that it is making are going to stop being made and the lowering of those hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are going to signal to the uterus, there's not a pregnancy here, so let's get rid of the endometrium because we need to have a new endometrium, a new fresh one next month in case pregnancy occurs. And so this is going to contract all this muscle and it's gonna push out the endometrium. So it can be very painful for, for women. The bottom of the uterus, it looks like a half moon. It's called the cervix. The cervix has a little hole from the uterus, and then the endometrium can be pushed out of the vagina. Other structures that are there to kind of protect all of these tubes right here from bacteria and other foreign objects from infecting these tubes you have the skin folds. The first skin fold, the smaller, closer one, is called the labia minor, and the second skin fold is called the labia major. In this diagram, it just calls them labia, but this is technically the labia minor and labia major. And one of the models, it's very clear that there's two. So on that model, I would want you to know labia minor and major on the other one, it just kind of looks like one complete thing and you can just call it labia. And even if you on the practical, on that particular model said 
this is the labia minor or labia major, I'd take it because it's not really specific. It's not super detailed. A couple other structures. The clitoris is here. The clitoris has about as many nerves as the penis has in it. It's for sexual stimulation. Um, stimulation of this will help also uh, mucus to be produced in the vagina, which is gonna do an additional lubricant for the penis to slide in there. So the like kind of connection between this is for sexual stimulation, but also in that sexual stimulation helps more lubricant to be made here. Pubic bone called the pubic synthesis here. Oh, and then one thing that I wanted to point out um, that wasn't really specific on the lab practice, I mean on the lab that you did the other day, a couple of things. Um, this is the end of the spinal cord. The end of the spinal cord, these bones that are here, outside of it, protect it. These whole bone system is called the sacrum. The last bone of the sacrum is called the coccyx. So I know that wasn't like, a lot of you guys didn't have, I didn't take off for that specifically, but um, because it wasn't specified. But the, just the very last bone is the coccyx. The rest of the whole thing is called the sacrum. So just know that is the coccyx. I think that's all I want to talk about there. Oh, and then just as a reiteration, um, this is the anus, the opening of the end of the large intestine. The end of the large intestine is the rectum. So egg production, as I mentioned, it begins in the fetus. All the quote unquote eggs, the really oocytes are made. They start being released at puberty. We, what we talked about when puberty starts by a maturation of the hypothalamus in the brain to make GnRH and then the pituitary to make LH and FSH to stimulate the ovaries to make estrogen and progesterone. What, and we'll look at, I have a picture of the follicle cells. The point is the maturing and what happens during the life of the female after birth is that you get the follicle cells. And those follicle cells are gonna be really important for, again, nourishing the oocyte on its journey out of the fallopian tube and into the uterus, um, also helping the process of only one sperm fertilizing that one egg. There's about 250 million sperm in one ejaculation. So it is pretty amazing that there is a system in place that the oocyte has made with those follicle cells to allow only one of those 250 million in and keep the rest of them out. So pretty cool. Okay, other structures to the system are accessories, again, help to help the oocyte get fertilized, travel, nourished, protected, Please remember this is on two sides. So that with females, there's a uterus in the middle, and then there's this whole system on both sides that go down into the uterus. So we have two of these, one here, and there would be one over here, going both to the uterus. So the ovary is gonna produce those matured oocytes. The fimbrae are gonna help to, during ovulation, guide, that oocyte through the fallopian tube, uterine tube, oviduct, ovarian tube, to the uterus. So this is an exaggeration. If the um, fallopian tube is not that far away from the ovary, but it just wants you to get the idea they're not connected like what you saw with the epididymis and the vas deferens. There is a little bit of a separation. And the uterus is kind of a nice picture because it shows you how the fallopian tube connects into the uterus. And you have the lining of the uterus, the endometrium. The muscle itself is called the myometrium, just you don't need, really need to know that, but the myometrium and the endometrium. 
So not a lot of space in here. It's more muscle. The uterus is really more muscle than space. What was the endometrium for again? The endometrium is the, it's full of blood, glands, energy, so that it can make a comfortable home for a fertilized egg until a placenta is made that makes a blood-to-blood -blood connection with the mother. So the fertilized egg is on its own until that placenta is made, and we'll get into the formation of the placenta during development, but it's kind of, it's on its own. So it needs to be comfortable, surrounded, it needs to be nourished, and that's what this kind of blood gland energy layer, the endometrium is for. Does the fetus space carry the whole tree? During the fertilized egg, does the egg space uh, the whole period? Yeah, yes, it does. But the endometrium eventually, so, and we'll get into that too, um, that it does stay in the uterus and then it starts to get other, as development happens, it starts to get other accessory structures like an amniotic sac, amniotic fluid, an umbilical cord that connects to the placenta it's a placenta so you get all these other structures to carry on the job of what the endometrium initially did and do it in a more sophisticated way with like a big sac the amniotic sac the amniotic fluid umbilical cord to placenta placenta to the mother to make a blood flow connection this one of the like many amazing things about the uterus is that the uterus is probably half the size of a fist and it can stretch to hold a 10, some like, you know, five to 12 pound baby. So it can go from smaller than this to that. We don't have a lot of organs that can do that. The stomach can stretch certainly, but this is um, pretty amazing. All right, so let's talk about the menstrual cycle. So we say that it's 28 days. It depends on the woman, it depends on the month, it depends on the day, it depends on, um, some people are exactly 28 days, some people are 26 days, some people can range from 13 days to 40 days. It can change. So, and sometimes someone can be super regular and be like 28 days and then suddenly you get to college and you get stressed out and it starts to get all like over the place. So um, one of the things for females, it's really important and it's so great that there's apps now that you can track this. And especially if you don't want to get pregnant or if you do want to get pregnant, it's really important to track this um, because things can change from day to day, especially with everyday stresses. And with COVID, um, the vaccine made, I read an article that made a lot of women's cycles really messed up. And so people were having their menstrual cycle after the vaccine every two weeks for like four months. Some people didn't have it for four months. Some people were off schedule for a few months. So that, you know, things that happen in our world around us can greatly influence the regularity of the menstrual cycle. So again, lots of things. Your genetics too. If your mother had issues with a regular cycle, you probably will as well. So there's lots of issues that can affect it. Um, medication, as I mentioned, like, like the vaccine or drugs. If you go on a new medication, it can mess that up. So it's really important for women to also think like, what's new in my life and can mess with this in case, again, you're trying to get pregnant or not trying to get pregnant. So let's start where, with the beginning. GnRH from the hypothalamus is going to be released. It's going to go in an interstitial area next to the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is going to diffuse into, pituitary is going to make LH and FSH. Those are going to travel through the blood. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, is going to stimulate the follicles around the oocytes in the ovary to increase, to beef up, to get bigger. Also, the FSH is going to stimulate the ovaries to begin to release estrogen. The increase in estrogen 
is going to also promote the oocyte to get closer and closer to the edge of the ovary so that it starts getting ready for ovulation. Only one oocyte is released per month. So this is a big difference between male reproduction and the reproductive system and what happens in the female is that with every ejaculation, there is approximately 250 million sperm or gametes made. With females, one per month. In a month, males will probably release a billion sperm. Billion to one in a month. Big difference. So every time male release sperm, they have to go through the spermatophagy. It's like, um, is it like the, the meiosis? Yes. And then, and then woman is only had one. It's right. Only one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the other thing that's going to happen is the follicle cells are going to continue what, what the follicle cells do in addition to protecting the oocyte is they secrete their own estrogen. So now we have estrogen secreted from the ovary and the oocyte, the follicle cells around it. All of this estrogen is saying to the uterus, hey, more endometrium, I'm coming. Guess what? Maybe, maybe this oocyte is going to need some protection and because maybe it's going to get fertilized. The estrogen travels back through the bloodstream and when it gets to the hypothalamus, it says more GnRH. Is that positive or negative feedback? Positive. Good. So remembering from the other day, feedback system is you have a cascade. One thing tells another thing to tell another thing. The end one goes back to the first one. And if it says stop, it's a negative feedback. If the end one, like this case, the estrogen goes back to the hypothalamus and says more GnRH, that's a positive feedback loop. Good. GnRH stimulates LH and FSH also, but a big surge in LH around the 14th day of the menstrual cycle. The LH, the luteinizing hormone, is going to stimulate that oocyte to undergo the first stage of meiosis. So we have that first split. I'm gonna look at, we're gonna look at meiosis are we going to look at it now? Yeah, okay. So we're going to take a look at that. First stage of meiosis is very different than what happens in the sperm. When we look at the oocyte, the oocyte is going to split, and instead of making two identical cells, it makes a bigger cell, a bigger oocyte, and what we call a polar body. So remember when I said that the sperm does not carry all of the organelles to make a cell. So the oocyte has to do that. In addition, the oocyte has to be ready for the dumping off of the genetic material of the sperm, merge the 23 and the 23 chromosomes, but then also be ready to nourish the process of cleavage, that one cell into two, into four, into eight. And so it needs to have a lot of extra energy than a regular cell does because it's still moving and it's got to develop so the oocyte is going to help that process of cleavage in addition to the endometrium helping it. So you have the oogonium undergoes mitosis to become the polar, the primary oocyte. The LH at about day 14 is going to stimulate this to undergo the first stage of meiosis. And in that first split, the point of this cell becoming one bigger cell and one teeny little cell, or even just a little body, not even quite a cell, is that you've got to split down the chromosomes. But you split the chromosomes and you dump 23 times two, half of those chromosomes, so that this one can be really, really big, and this one is just the chromosomes. 
So the point of the polar bodies is to allow this cell, the secondary oocyte, to be much bigger, but still split the chromosomes in half and keep that division of the chromosomes going so that eventually we end up with a egg with 20, 23 chromosomes that's really, really big. So this cell is essentially gonna take all the stuff of these other divisions and be four times bigger than the primary oocyte. Remember the sperm became four equal sized cells at the end. And this one becomes one really big cell and then the division of the chromosomes into these polar bodies. These polar bodies can't develop into other cells because they don't have enough space for their organelles to work. And so the polar bodies typically just get reabsorbed by the female body. Um, this is precarious, I, I'm not really sure and nobody has data to show whether that polar body then is stimulated to undergo meiosis too. I would guess that it can't because there's no space in here for the cell division to go accordingly. And I would guess this just gets absorbed by the body and this never happens. So it depends on the textbook that you look at, um, whether it shows the polar body undergoes meiosis too or if it doesn't, but I would say hypothetically it does not. The secondary oocyte, it's got 23 times two chromosomes, so two sets of 23 that still need to be divided. This is really interesting. Meiosis two in the secondary oocyte only happens if a sperm fertilizes it. So most secondary oocytes never undergo meiosis two. It's that stimulation of the sperm. As soon as the sperm starts to wiggle in to the outer layers, and we'll talk about the changing of the follicle cells into outer layers, once it starts wiggling in, it's gonna stimulate the secondary oocyte to undergo meiosis too, pop out a polar body, get rid of 23 chromosomes, and so that you have the egg. The egg cell is only called an egg when it gets fertilized, when the secondary oocyte gets fertilized by a sperm. Then once it's fertilized, you have the egg, fertilized egg, and as soon as it undergoes the first stage of meiosis or cleavage in development, it's no longer called an egg. So the term egg is very temporary and very quick. So pretty fascinating, right? That the process of meiosis has changed so much, evolved in females to allow for all of this other stuff to happen. Okay, so back to, that's day 14 that that occurs. That day 14 right here. This is that day 14. Okay, the follicle cells are going to change, mature into what are called the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum has its own set of jobs now. So the maturation of those follicle cells around the oocyte going to stimulate this to make hormones that are going to be more signaling. You can actually see like a jelly-like layer, so more protection. Those follicle cells mature, make jelly, make more protection. But also, and we said before that the follicle cells were secreting their own estrogen, but now with the corpus luteum, the follicle cells have matured to make a second kind of hormone called progesterone. So it's at this step, and that's why, instead of just calling them regular follicle cells, because they make this jelly layer that you'll see under the microscope when you look at the slides of the fertilized egg, you'll see that jelly layer there that the corpus luteum produces but also pretty interesting that the follicle cells at this point have matured to become, uh, the, to have the ability to produce progesterone. Complex. So now, the estrogen and the progesterone travel up to the brain and it's really the progesterone mainly that says to the hypothalamus, do not produce any more GnRH. We, we got it, the follicle cells are done. We're super mature, 
We don't need to keep going through the process to beef up the follicle cells, so stop. Is that a positive or a negative feedback loop the second time around? Good, negative, right? So no more GnRH, no more FSH, no LH. No FSH because no GnRH, so no more beefing up of the follicle cells. The estrogen and the progesterone are going to stimulate the uterus to beef up the endometrium. Add, add, add. Endometrium continues to thicken. Nice and fresh endometrium to welcome the possibility of a fertilized, always, uh, fertilized egg, I should call it. After a few days though, corpus luteum only lasts so long. After a few days, the corpus luteum begins to disintegrate. So again, only a small window that fertilization can occur. That's why women will track their cycle and specifically know when ovulation is going to occur because you only got a small window for this corpus luteum to be intact. Because once the corpus luteum starts to break down everything else in the oocyte starts to break down too. Follicle cells continue to break down, the oocyte breaks down, and then there's nothing to fertilize. So just, again, small window here because the corpus luteum will disintegrate and the endometrium's like, oh, nothing, there's no fertilized egg, so I'm gonna start to break down too. And the breaking down of these things, your body responds by, let's get rid of this stuff that's breaking down. So also, the estrogen and the progesterone as they fall, the levels start to come down, they're going to stimulate the process of menstruation. The lowering of progesterone is going to make the uterus contract. So, some women, after fertilization, sometimes women, their progesterone levels and, and just naturally could be related to stress could be related to medicine and other factors in their life. But if progesterone levels during pregnancy, especially that beginning, are low, what your body's gonna do, it's gonna kick out the endometrium with the fertilized egg, and it's gonna result in a miscarriage. And so once someone knows they're pregnant, one of the first things that they do is they go in to the doctor's office and they get a blood test. A blood test is not just tracking like, is CG there? Remember the chorionic gonadotropin, that after cleavage starts happening, the cleaving cells are gonna start pumping out that chorionic gonadotropin, the CG, but also they're checking the progesterone levels in the blood. And if the progesterone levels are too low, they're gonna supplement that to the woman. And so there's some things in that blood test that are maybe not so apparent until you like know a little more. So flow of tissue, blood, nutrients, that's menstruation, menstrual cycle, ending, beginning, depends on what you want to call it. The term menses, menstrual menses, in Latin it means month. So even though not every month is 28 days, right? It's not necessarily once a month, it'll shift a bit. Um, it's approximately a month. And again, depending on a lot of factors. Progesterone levels fall. Without progesterone around, the hypothalamus goes, oh, nothing's stopping me from making GnRH to contact the pituitary to make LH and FSH and then make that cycle all begin again. So the corpus luteum breaking down and progesterone levels falling coincide with menstruation happening and usually about the end of menstruation, the progesterone levels are so low that now the cycle starts again because the hypothalamus says, oh, GnRH, I can make it because there's no progesterone stopping me. And then again, the cycle happens. All of this takes about 28 days. Super fascinating, right? Compli oh, complicated, super complicated. Lots of things happening, yes, well said. 
So if you remember from looking at the slide the other day, you saw a lot of different oocytes. And the darker purple circles are the oocytes. And then you can see that what the FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, the point of it from the pituitary gland is to make some of these get more and more follicle cells around them. Follicular liquid that's gonna have things like energy in it follicle cells that are going to mature to become the corpus luteum. The follicle cells, remember, initially are going to make estrogen, but as they mature, after ovulation, they become the corpus luteum and they produce estrogen and progesterone, but they also produce other layers. Oh, no, I'm not getting there. I'll get there. I think in um, development, I'll talk about the other layers that are going to do things that when that first sperm wiggles through two outer layers that are additionally there are going to start to chemically change so no other sperm can get in. So there's additional process to those follicle cells that not only produce hormones but also are going to ensure one sperm gets in and the rest of them get locked out. So menstruation occurs due to a decrease in what? Specific, be specific. Yeah. Because of this. The decrease in this causes a decrease in that, right? But that's gotta happen first. Sorry, but I'm sorry, but why do they decrease? Why does these decrease? Yeah. Because the corpus luteum, remember the follicle cells around the oocyte mature into the corpus luteum. And after a few days, after ovulation, the corpus luteum, if, it, if there's no fertilization, they start to break down. And the corpus luteum cells, when they break down, the levels of estrogen and progesterone that they produce go down. Because it's... It gets reabsorbed by the body. Well, this will actually, like the, the cells with the oocyte will go down the fallopian tube into the endometrium and it gets flushed out with the endometrium during menstruation. Okay, good question. So, okay, so this, like, like you said, complicated. This is all that's going on during the menstrual cycle. All these things are happening simultaneously. So I really like this illustration and that at first you look at it and you're like, holy cow, what is happening in this illustration? But it's kind of lining out all of the different hormones and players in this process and what happens with each of them during different times. So this is a really nice kind of way to, if you take a deep breath and look at it, you can look at the endometrium formation on its own through the 28 days, the estrogen progesterone levels, the follicular development, the FSH and the LH and the GnRH. So how does pregnancy affect all this? So remember that if the corpus luteum has a sperm that comes in, it will not break down. Because it's still intact, it's gonna keep producing estrogen and progesterone. Progesterone levels are gonna keep the uterus from contracting, progesterone especially. It's gonna prevent the uterus from contracting and pushing anything out. So when estrogen, so when progesterone specifically, the levels are high, keeps the uterus like this, not like this. So the embryo prevents the pushing out of the endometrium, the corpus luteum producing the progesterone. So we've got to monitor that, make sure progesterone levels stay high. So physically prevent it from physically prevents it. it says no sensor for no contraction because progesterone is there progesterone says do not contract uterus do not something important is in here don't contract okay what hormone the well, we'll get you guys didn't learn blast over that 
flesh is one of the stages of cleavage. So the embryo, what hormone during cleavage is the embryo pumping out itself too? CG. CG, right, good. I mentioned it this one while ago, so you heard it. Good, CG. CG is another signal from the corpus luteum. Progesterone, high. CG, high. And they both say to the uterus, don't contract. Something's in here. It's important. We've got things going on. Developing embryo, fetus, don't contract. So as long as those levels stay high, pregnancy can continue. Progesterone, estrogen from the corpus luteum, CG from the embryo, all those things. Got to monitor them, make sure they stay high. Also, what they're going to do is they're going to continue to say more endometrium. Let's keep adding to the endometrium because we got a little tiny bit of time before the placenta develops. So these things also are going to say something important is inside the uterus. Hey, uterus, don't contract, keep adding. So intercourse, sometimes it's called copulation. We don't really hear that term. It's very biological, kind of outdated. Internal fertilization. Remember we looked at corals the other day, how they're like just pumping out during the full moon, warmest day of summer. They're gonna pump out tons of eggs, tons of sperm and be like, good luck. I hope we get some embryos formed because the currents, right? They do tons of them because they really hope that fertilization is going to occur out there. But remember, there's like in the Caribbean, for example, there's 66 different species of coral, of hard coral. There's a lot of other species of soft coral. There's a lot of other invertebrates. Everybody's using that full moon to pump out their gametes, their sperm and egg. And what are the chances of the same species of sperm and egg then finding each other in this mix of a ton of different sperm and egg? So it's very difficult. We have a really brilliant form of reproduction in which there's so many things designed to bring the penis into the vagina as close as possible to get the sperm to the egg. All of those fluids to help that process, all of those layers of the oocyte to help that process be so precise. So we are lucky as humans that we have a really good design of reproduction. So again, you start thinking about all of this and you're like, wow, the complexity, that's amazing how it's all involved. It makes our process of reproduction super Efficient. I mean, as efficient as it can be, right? More efficient than most other organisms out there. So pretty cool in terms of evolution, I think. Fertilization happens not in the uterus. Fertilization actually happens in the fallopian tube. So the oocyte is fertilized in the fallopian tube and then it travels a few days. It takes a few more days to get into the uterus. So remember that fertilization doesn't happen inside of the uterus. It happens in the fallopian tube, the oviduct, the ovarian tube, the uterine tube. The egg has barriers. So in addition to the corpus luteum, it's going to add some other layers to it that are going to facilitate the process of one sperm fertilizing one egg there. Remember the head of the sperm has the nucleus and then in the tip of the sperm it has enzymes called acrosomes, which are gonna to work together. All the sperm are gonna to work together to weaken the outer layers of the egg, of the oocyte, secondary oocyte. They're gonna to work together to weaken the secondary oocyte layers so that they can start to wiggle in. So it's a big, the egg is like, got all kinds of layers to it that are important. So sperm counts, you hear a lot about that. If people are having issues, if a partnership is having issues reproducing, they'll look at sperm count 
in an ejaculation, and then they'll look at the health of the eggs in the female. And so if a male has low sperm count, the important thing here is the amount of sperm that can contribute their acrosomes to the weakening of the layers. Because one, even though you need one sperm to fertilize one secondary oocyte, you need a lot of sperm's acrosomes to start to weaken the outer layers. So you need hundreds of sperm to basically be banging into the outer layers of the secondary oocyte to weaken that. And so if there's a low sperm count, there's not enough acrosomes to weaken the layers for one to get in. And so sperm count has to be sufficient enough. The outer protective layer is called the corona radiata. Again, hundreds of sperms, acrosomes need to contribute to weakening that outer layer. When they do that, the first sperm, so even though you could be the first sperm to get to the oocyte, it doesn't mean that you're going to be, and it probably means you're not gonna be the one that actually fertilizes. Because you're gonna pop off your acrosome and you're gonna be like waiting for everybody else to come. And so just the, of, you know, you're one of hundreds that has a chance to get in there. Once all of these are um, weakening the corona radiata, there's a second layer, the zona pellucida. There is stimulation of when the corona radiata starts to get weakened and one sperm gets into the zona pellucida, the oocyte, it's like fascinating, the whole system, the oocyte stimulates the release of calcium ions, and the calcium ions flood to the outer layers and make the chemistry change here so that anybody else who's in there dies. <laughs> Kills everybody else off. Yeah, it's so cool. So that everybody else, so like if you're stuck in, these, in this outer layer and one gets into the zone of pellucida, you get killed. And then it's up to this one to continue on. Once this one gets in, stimulates the second stage of meiosis to happen in the secondary oocyte, polar body pops out that second set of chromosomes. So we have 23 and finally the egg is formed. Egg is formed and as soon as the sperm and egg fertilize, the sperm fertilizes that egg, it changes its name. <laughs> So again, egg very, very short-lived. So this is actually a sea urchin because it's um, hard to show what happens in the uh, humans. But this gives you an idea of the size of the oocyte to the size of all those sperm. It's approximately the same in humans in terms of the size. The other thing to think about is that sperm, there has to be, you know, 250, I said before, I read the other day, 300 million here, quite a bit of a million, millions of sperm, right? Because the female reproductive system, so this is the other thing that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so remember that the sperm, remember when you looked under the microscope at this, those little tiny squiggles were blown up a hundred times. So imagine like the little tiny squiggles, reduce them down a hundred times. They, they're just not even, you could probably fit a million of them on um, a dot on your page, right? So, or maybe a billion even, they're teeny. Their journey has to go from here into here, up here, and fertilization usually occurs up there. So contextually, it's like a sperm is about to run a marathon. If you were gonna run a marathon, would you carry like your whole book bag with all your books on your back and a couple of jugs of water and some food for the day? No, right? Marathon runners wear like shorts and a t-shirt and then they rely on stations throughout the marathon 
to nourish them. And that's like what the sperm does. It gets rid of all of the organelles that it, as possible, as much as possible, because it's gonna run a marathon. Now remember, there's two of these. There's one on each side. So what if you get into the uterus and you're like, mm, you gotta choose. Am I gonna go that way or am I gonna go that way? So a lot of them end up, there's gotta be hundreds of millions of them because a lot of them end up going the wrong way to a dead end. They're up the other fallopian tube going, shoot, I don't find anything up here. A bunch of them are just gonna go like, wee, 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 swim around in there and never even make it up into one of the fallopian tubes. So out of that like 250 million, you gotta have at least a few hundred that are going to go the right direction at the same time to contribute their acrosomes. All right, so I think that's a good place. Wait, I think maybe you have like a couple more sentences on that sperm and then we'll stop. Let me just get there. First sperm that actually gets in, stimulates secondary oocyte to undergo meiosis two. Going to fuse together 23 chromosomes and 23 chromosomes. Come together inside of here. Corona radiata, zona pellucida, change their chemistry, block everybody out, kill, 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 kill. We don't want more than one sperm in there. We don't want any extra chromosomes. Haploid, haploid means 23 chromosomes of the egg, haploid 23 chromosomes of the sperm come together to make what we call diploid dye, meaning two, two sets. One set of chromosomes from biological mom, one from biological dad. That's why we have two sets of 23 chromosomes to make a diploid number in the cells in our body. Okay, we didn't even get to the other parts. Okay, so, lab today study the models i'll go through the models with you and i want to point out some like there are a couple precarious structures are precarious like the vast deferens on the torso model of the male is like uh, difficult to find so i will show you that i'll point that out and a couple other things i have my keys today so whoever goes first please um, open the door thank you